Bueno, en primer lugar... En primer lugar, tenemos con nosotros a William McRew, de la Universidad de Cambridge, de, del LICHIS, el Departamento de Antropología Biológica. Y quiero hacer un, una breve semblanza, porque su trayectoria es muy dilatada, sus contribuciones científicas son enormes. Y quiero destacar de, de Bill, eh, que es eh, doctor en Antropología por la Universidad de Stirling y actualmente, como os he dicho, es profesor de primatología evolutiva en el Leverhulme Center for Human Evolutionary Studies en Cambridge. Y bueno, quizá eh, lo más llamativo, lo más, eh, eh, digamos, especial de su trayectoria científica es el interés que Bill ha suscitado en, entre la comunidad científica por su investigación en socioecología y, sobre todo, por la tecnología de los chimpancés, la evolución de la cultura material en, en primates, así como otros estudios interesantes en la lateralidad y la función eh, de muchos primates, la funcionalidad de muchos primates, y sobre todo y últimamente en, en la rehabilitación de los grandes simios, la conservación y la rehabilitación de de estas especies que están eh, en peligro. Pues desde 2004 forma parte de la Comisión de los Grandes Simios del Grupo Especial de Primates de la IUCN, un órgano eh, importante a nivel mundial, el más importante a nivel mundial en la conservación para los primates. Además, eh, quiero destacar también entre sus numerosas contribuciones eh, un magnífico libro que os recomiendo, de 2004, The Culture Chimpanzee Reflections on Cultural Primatology, eh, donde, donde da cabida a toda una serie de reflexiones sobre la cultura material y, y la evolución de la tecnología en, en los chimpancés, así como recomendaros fervientemente su, una de sus últimas contribuciones en Nature sobre Primate Archaeology, muy, eh, muy sugerente y además muy, muy interesante, entre las que algunas de sus eh, conclusiones, de sus sugerencias, vamos a ver presentadas, vamos a ver presentadas aquí. Y bueno, sería interminable eh, hablar de, de toda su producción científica en su gran dilatada experiencia y no quiero enrollarme más y os, os dejo con, con la interesante ponencia de, de Bill. Adelante, muchas gracias. Uh, muchas gracias. Uh, and those are the only words I will say in Spanish. I must apologize for having to speak to you in English. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Or I guess that's actually a silly question. You'll hear it through the headphones. But um, it is a great pleasure to be here. And I had high expectations uh, of what I have read and what I have heard. But now that I am seeing this place and meeting these people, I am extremely impressed by what you are building here. I, <clears throat> I think that you will have not only uh, a good Europe, European center, um, one of the best, but also internationally, you, know, you will be competing with the best in the world. So today, uh, I speak to you as a primatologist, and I'm hoping that what I have to say will be of interest to those who are studying human origins and human evolution in general. And so the title, In Search of the Common Ancestor, in particular the last common ancestor, means that I am seeking to shed light on, or rather we in primatology are seeking to shed light on that creature which lived seven to nine million years ago, uh, which was the last common ancestor before the lines that lead to living apes and the lines that have led to living human beings separated. We have no fossils for that form yet, or arguably we don't have fossils for that form yet. Uh, and if we are interested in behavior, then the best we can do until we invent a time machine, which 
we can do in science fiction, but not yet in science, the best we can do to understand or to, to, to infer the behavior of the last common ancestor is to look at those living creatures with whom we shared that last common ancestor, and those are the African apes. So that's the emphasis of my talk today. But we must put this, whoops, sorry, I want to go back. Just uh, the photograph of the chimpanzee in the baobab tree, uh, this is to remind me to say that some people say, don't we already know everything we need to know about chimpanzees? Didn't Jane Goodall start telling us about chimpanzees 50 years ago? Is there anything new? I want to convince you that new things are coming out all the time. This is the first time this photograph has been shown outside the United Kingdom, and it's of a form of elementary technology that wild chimpanzees use in West, far west Africa, in Senegal. And that chimpanzee is using the bough of the tree as an anvil upon which to smash open the fruit of the baobab. So it's a very simple form of elementary technology. But we are here, I'm just going to take this off. Um, <clears throat> we are here because 2009 has been the year of Darwin. I don't know how it has been in Spain, but in the United Kingdom this year, you cannot turn around without seeing a reference to Darwin, and particularly in Cambridge, because of it being his uh, scientific uh, workplace, or at least his or scientific origins. And so it's nice to see the year rounding out and finishing with a conference uh, along these lines. It's very easy to find uh, quotations from Darwin for just about anything. Uh, it's not so easy to find them <clears throat> about um, apes, at least in the beginning. But even as early as 1859, Darwin, looking ahead, was saying that in the distant future I see open fields for far more important uh, researches. And there we get to the key sentence, the, the only sentence in the origin, really, which refers directly to human origins, light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. Later, in the, as you would expect, in the book The Descent of Man, then the African apes are put in their proper place. It is therefore probable that Africa was formerly inhabited by extinct apes, closely allied to the gorilla and the chimpanzee. And as these two species are now man's nearest allies, allies is a slightly tricky term in the sense that we exploit them, it is somewhat more probable that our earliest progenitors lived on the African continent than elsewhere. So in 1879, he had it right. So often the case with Darwin. Now, I have to interject something here. If you read the October 2nd issue of Science, you know that it was devoted, mostly, to the description, the detailed description of a new fossil form, Ardipithecus remedus. The fossil taxon had been described um, 15 years earlier in a very brief and introductory way, but the October issue of Science included 11 articles covering everything from the paleoecology to the detailed osteology of this new fossil form. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not qualified to talk about that because I'm just a working primatologist. But in the process of making their interpretations, Tim White and particularly Owen Lovejoy uh, have made strong assertions about whether or not living apes really are so important or not in terms of understanding human evolution. So it, it, it seems to me that I need to respond to this. I need to recognize their criticisms and attempt to respond to this. So please, as you listen to the rest of my talk, would you think in terms of whether or not I am making a case that is convincing to you that we still need to study the great apes to learn more about our origins. Now, if you think that I'm exaggerating, then I just extracted three quotations from that issue of science. So if you just look at the yellow print, <clears throat> Lovejoy said that extant African ape-based models are no longer appropriate. 
So that's a rejection. Second one, no modern ape is a realistic proxy for characterizing early hominid evolution, whether social or locomotor. So if white et al. are correct, we will learn nothing about the social lives of early human beings, nor even about their locomotory behavior by studying apes. And if you move to the third quote, the hominid path led to cognition, whereas that leading to pan, our closest living relatives did not. If that statement is true, then there are a lot of people who are working in Leipzig and St. Andrews in Scotland and Atlanta, Georgia, and in the USA who are very confused because they think they are studying cognition in great apes. So this is the challenge, and to go back to the title of your conference, possibly even the crisis that we in primatology are dealing with as of last month. And if science accepts the letter that we have submitted for publication, you will see the response of the primatologists uh, published as well. But it is a good reason, uh, uh, th this criticism or these assertions, is a good reason to, um, for me to address some issues and perhaps uh, resolve some confusions. Uh, White and Lovejoy seem to believe that chimpanzees are found only in rainforests, uh, and for that matter, other apes. But in fact, chimpanzees live in a very wide variety of ecotypes. Within the, ca the, the general category of forest, they are found in evergreen forests, yes, but also in gallery forests, in riverine forests, in swamp forests, in seasonally inundated swamp forests, in primary forests, second, every kind of forest, I think, that you can put forward as being present in Africa within the geographical range of the species, I think you will find chimpanzees either now or you did in the very distant past, or the very uh, near past. But it's not just forest. It's also into woodland. Deciduous woodland, open woodland, closed woodland, woodland with a grassy understory, even scrub woodland. And also in thicket, bushland, light gaps, <clears throat> even in places where there is horticulture, where crops are grown um, outside of fields, and yes, even in grassland. So chimpanzees are living today in Africa in, in wooded grassland, in tall grass, short grass, not, however, in steppe. That's the exception I would have to make. So apes travel and forage and sleep and do everything else in their lives in all of these ecotypes, of course, to varying extents. And any given population of chimpanzees will not have all of these biotypes available, but they will al almost certainly have several of them available. And there is a considerable published literature, uh, particularly on these dry open sites, places like Asterik in Senegal, Bafing in Mali, Fongoli, Senegal, Semliki in Uganda, and most particularly, Ugala in Tanzania. These are not well-known names yet, but they are places where these, where studies of chimpanzees in open habitats are occurring. So on the, on the screen, you see on the left, a classic rainforest setting, and on the right, you see a baobab woodland with a grassy understory. And there are chimpanzees in both those places. It's worth reminding you that chimpanzees have a broad distribution across Africa, from as far west in Africa as you can go to Senegal to Tanzania in the east. And studies of, ch of chimpanzees are going on right across the continent. Ugala in Tanzania is a particularly important place because it's a big area that's relatively unaffected by human activity. It still has the full range of carnivores, ungulates, um, other sympatric species. The Nimba Mountains are important because that, that is a place where there is a montane population of chimpanzees. These, I mean, the Nimba Mountains are not big by Alpine standards or Himalayan standards, but they are uh, the tallest mountains in West Africa. And there are chimpanzees on, in those Alpine meadows, at least crossing over these Alpine meadows. 
Again, I focus on Ugala because it is the habitat type that is found there, the open deciduous woodland with the open canopy and the grassy understory that is very, very similar to the habitat that White and Lovejoy have described for Ordipithecus. It looks to me to be almost identical. And chimpanzees are being studied there by students from the University of Cambridge and the University of California. Now what about modeling the last common ancestor? Can I be a little bit more precise about what's involved? We are forced to model because we have no direct access. So what else can we do? The question is how to choose our models. And a, a simple and obvious question is that you might want to choose different models to tackle different questions. I'm not going to say that there is one single model that we should all use because it's somehow better than all the others. But there are at least two types. Referential models are those that refer directly to living forms. We make use directly of living forms. Sometimes that reference is based on homology, that is, living forms that are phylogenetically close to us and are accessible to us like the African apes. Sometimes we choose those models on the basis of analogy. They are ecologically close. For example, there was a time when the baboon model was important in human evolutionary <coughs> studies. Now the capuchin monkey from South America, who is very distantly related to us, but does some very interesting things ecologically, um, is worth paying attention to. Or sometimes we do the combination of homology and analogy. So we seek to look at chimpanzees, our closest living relations, in places that are ecologically similar, as similar as we can determine, to where the hominid form that we're trying to model lived. Sometimes we use a single species referential model. In this case, most of what I'll talk about today will be based on Pantroglodites, but in some cases we can do comparative referential modeling as between the two members of the genus Pan, Panpaniscus, the bonobo, and Pantroglodites, the chimpanzee. I just put in a couple, of a couple of photographs. On the right is a Cebus monkey using a hammerstone to crack a nut on a boulder anvil. And on the left are the famous Japanese macaques of Koshima, who uh, have shown us uh, cultural evolution in, this, in the sense of cultural change uh, in their diet, in this case, eating sweet potatoes. The other type of modeling that we see often is, is called non-referential as a kind of catch-all term. These are strategic or conceptual, uh, sometimes called, they're called adaptive suite models, where you use the basic principles of evolutionary ecology, independent of any kind of phylogenetic relationship, as a starting point to build a model to explain a particular phenomenon. So for example, an isogamy, which is just the fancy term for the difference between sperm and egg, can be the starting point for an argument that leads you into sexual selection, which will lead you to sexual dimorphism, which can lead you to sexual division of labor, if that's what you're trying to explain um, in, in human evolutionary terms. So we start with essentially uh, reproductive physiology, and we end up talking about cultural institutions the division of labor between males and females. I'm going to make the case for referential modeling for the rest of this talk on one basic simple foundation. That referential modeling allows us to use real behavior that we can see and record and count and measure in the real world. We don't have to imagine the behavior, we record the behavior and that fleshes out the bones and, and the stones. So, the aims of the talk are to summarize and to update recent findings from ethological, behavioral, and from ecological studies of the two surviving species of Pan, chimpanzee and bonobo. And I will focus on those that are relevant to human origins. There could be a whole other talk on uh, cognition, on emotion, 
on certain aspects of social behavior. But within the time limits, I'm going to stick to another set of topics. I will base the talk on field studies, not lab, recent, the last five years, and I will emphasize behavior that is shown spontaneously by the apes as opposed to experimentally induced behavior. I'm a field worker, that's what I do, so I should talk about what I know. And the general topics are five, technology, diet, shelter, thermoregulation, and ranging. So let's start with technology, which I hope will be of some interest to those of you who are in archaeology. We now know that each chimpanzee population has a toolkit. That is, it has a repertoire of the tools that are used by that community, and that this corresponds more or less to what we see in humans as material culture. And if we compare sites in, in Africa where the apes are habituated, by habituated I mean they are so tame that we can follow them from the time they get up in the morning to the time they go to bed at night and collect behavioral data at a close distance. We can have a complete behavioral record of their day. There are now enough populations that we can begin to do some analyses. And it turns out that the toolkit of the average chimpanzee community is about 20 types. So it's a range, as you see here, from 16 to 22, but it's more or less 20 plus or minus two or three. But there's an interesting exception, the Uganda exception. There, there are three populations, very well known and very well studied, where the toolkit is only half the size, only about 10 tool types. This is a, a genuine difference that has emerged over decades of ethnogra ethnographic work by primatologists in the field. And it is yet to be explained. And if you're going to ask me to give you the answer for why there is this difference, I cannot do so. It, re it remains something to be done. But it's a, a genuine difference. If we look at one of those with uh, non-Ugandan populations, like Gulugo, the most frequent three types seen, that is in terms of frequency, they're all extractive foraging. They are basically elementary technology applied to extracting resources. If we go to one of the Ugandan populations, Ngogo, the top three types have nothing to do with extractive foraging. They're used in hygiene and in courtship. So there are genuine differences across regions of Africa and across populations and across communities. But there are also similarities, and we should not lose track of the similarities if we, uh, when we go to look for differences. So there, it turns out that there are about 30 patterns. Um, no, that's not true. There are about 20 tool use patterns, which are chimpanzee universals. That is, they are found in one form or another in all populations that have been studied for a certain length of time or greater. And these perform a variety of functions. All chimpanzee populations use leaf sponges to get drinking water. All of them do aimed throwing, which is a very simple form of, of weapon use. All of them use toys, at least in terms of starting play interactions amongst mothers and child, children or, or youngsters. All of them display with objects. Branch dragging is a universal and so on. The slide chosen here to illustrate this is of termite fishing, a form of extractive foraging, uh, which Jane Goodall reported almost 50 years ago, and which turns out to vary, interestingly, across Africa, with some populations having it and some not. Second point about technology is tool sets. By a tool set, I mean two or more types of tools that are used in an obligate sequence to achieve a single goal. Most often this is seen in, in honey extraction. Now why would that be? Well, 
Everybody loves honey, including chimpanzees. It's the most perfect food that is presented to us by nature. It's very digestible, it's highly energetic, and it tastes delicious. And chimpanzees are suckers for honey just like everyone else. But to get honey, they have to break through a number of defenses, both behavioral and mechanical. A recent paper has shown that sometimes up to five different tools are needed to succeed in extracting honey from wild bees' nests. A pounder, a perforator, an enlarger, a collector, a swab. Each has a different function. There are other examples with a two-set, uh, sorry, a two-tool two-sets or three-tool two-sets. Um, but the point about obligate sequence is that if it's, if it's a four-tool set, it has to be A, B, C, D. It cannot be A, C, D, B. You cannot do D unless you did C, and you cannot do C unless you did B, and so on. Some people have suggested that, if I dare use the word, that might involve complex cognition to achieve that kind of elementary technology. Now let's move on to another type of technology, tool composites. The idea that two or more tools are used together simultaneously and complementarily to achieve a goal. This is something that we as humans take for granted, right? The bow and arrow. The arrow is of no use without the bow. The bow is of no use without the arrow. They have to be used together. A mortar and pestle that the chemist uses. Got to have both. For chimpanzees, the obvious example is the hammer and the anvil. Certain hard objects cannot be opened, cannot, uh, the, the contents cannot be extracted unless we have both the hard surface as the anvil and the hammer to operate on that. So at Basu, we now know that not only are certain hammers better than others, and certain anvils are better than others in terms of the chimpanzees' expressed preferences, but certain combinations are much preferred. And they are preferred by individuals. So Fred may prefer to use hammer number 17 and anvil number 32, and Susie may prefer to use hammer number 11 in combination with anvil number 47. So we have some interesting detailed information coming out of recent studies that we did not have before. And there's some other examples which I won't go into. So here is hammer and anvil use at a site called Basu in Guinea. The mother is the one doing the cracking with the stone in her left hand. The anvil is below and sitting on top of it is the nut of an oil palm. And her baby is watching closely and in the background another individual is cracking nuts. This is the work of Matsuzawa from Kyoto University and his colleagues um, working in Guinea. Fourth technology has to do with compound tools. Tools where two or more components are actually combined into a single technical unit. Compound tools, again, we take for granted, we use them every day. Um, a simple example from Archaeology would be a hafted spear where there is a shaft, there is a point, and there is something adhesive that connects the point to the shaft. Three elements combine to make a single tool, a working spear. A bead necklace, the kind of thing that is put forward from some place like Blombos Cave in South Africa is the earliest signs of human culture where you have snail shells that have been, had holes made in them and they would have been strung together. A necklace is a compound tool. String and shells. For chimpanzees, the leaf sponge could be put as an example. A handful of leaves are combined to make a single absorbent mass. So if the chimpanzee wants to get water out of a tree hole, but the, the opening is too narrow to get the mouth in or to get the hand in, you can always make a sponge, suck out the water, put it back in, suck out the water. Now you might say, well, okay, that's kind of a compound tool, but all the elements are the same. It's just six leaves or eight leaves or ten leaves. A better example might be the anvil wedge, where 
in the previous slide, sometimes when the chimpanzees want to make the, the anvil more efficient, in this case, if they want to make the surface more horizontal, they stick a little extra stone in under the edge to make the surface just that little bit better working. Um, but but the, most, the best example, in a way, is just the sleeping platforms or the beds that all great apes construct every night, new. So each night before it goes to bed, any chimpanzee, gorilla, bonobo, or orangutan, after the age of weaning, builds a bed. And this construction involves a frame, a mattress, and a lining. It's spring-loaded because these branches are interwoven, so it has spring to it. And I think that's a good candidate for a compound construction and technology. Here I uh, just show on the right, chimpanzees working at a tree hole where a leaf sponge is an appropriate tool to extract water. On the left, I have a leaf sponge, but in this population, chimpanzees also uses pith. This is pith from the phoenix palm uh, branches. And when they are used as sponges, these are the wet ones and these are the dry ones. So this is before and this is after. And finally, technology five has to do with taking technology from the present into the past. So now we know we have a field called primate archaeology, where archaeological theory and methods are applied to primate material culture. And, in, and when we work in the past, we can now legitimately uh, talk of the chimpanzee stone age. And you may know of this because the pioneering work was done by a Spanish primatologist, uh, Julio Mercader, now at the University of Calgary. No, Alberta. Alberta or Calgary. Um, and the point is that this nutcracking with these stone hammers and stone anvils yields lithic artifacts. That is, modified stone objects which are there to be found a hundred years later, a thousand years later, 10,000 years later, whatever. And they can be distinguished from natural breakage and from human breakage or human fracturing. And or at least that's what archaeologists tell me. On the theoretical front, an idea like the Chanel Courtois can be applied just as well to chimpanzee nutcracking as it can be to any human activity starting with the acquisition of raw materials, taking through all the stages until finally um, those objects are discarded or abandoned uh, when they're no longer useful. Primate archaeologists now in are, 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 are doing, not just talking about, but are doing systematic excavation, radiometric dating, organic residue analysis, recovering starch grains, for example, looking at micro wear patterns, well, macro and micro wear patterns, doing actualistic experimentation, and even doing museum studies. Some of the things that are in museums may not be what we, what we thought they were. This raises the possibility of a pre older one. That is, where the diagnostic wear patterns of percussive technology may be more easily recognizable by working with primatologists who have the behavior that goes with the artifact, so that perhaps uh, we will be assisted in saying what went on before 2.6 million years ago when flaked stones began to, be, to appear in the archaeological record. Moving on to diet. Omnivory in chimpanzees is well established now. Although primarily fruit eaters, in the sense that most energy comes from fruit, chimpanzees eat a whole variety of plant parts, as you see here. Not just fruit, but also seeds and flowers and leaves, stems, bark, gum, and animal matter, particularly in the form of insects, mammals, and then even some non-organic things. Particularly social insects are taken by tool-assisted extractive technology, termite fishing, ant dipping. And these tend to be social insects like ants and bees and termites because their collective biomass 
concentrated in one place makes them an efficient or a, a, an optimizable resource to exploit. So I'll just say a little bit about faunivory, about the consumption of animals. A similarity has been shown in the last six months between chimpanzees and bonobos in that they both take monkeys as prey. Why is this important? Well, we've known about chimpanzees eating monkeys for, for 45 years. For a long, long time, it looked as though bonobos had no interest in monkeys except possibly to play with them. But we now know by paying closer attention that at least one population takes monkeys. Monkey hunting is not easy. It's not a model that we would want to use for early hominids because it involves being very quick and agile up in the canopy. And one of the sacrifices that our ancestors made for the sake of bipedality was to lose that agility and dexterity up in the treetops. But there are also differences between chimpanzees and bonobos when it comes to the meat that is obtained by hunting. Chimpanzees distribute meat primarily starting with males as possessors, and the meat distribution is dominated by the possessors' uh, differential, treat differential treatment of other social companions. Primarily goes to other male allies and to potentially uh, reproductive females. Bonobo meat distribution is completely different. There it's the females who control the product of the hunt, and they distribute it to other females. So if you watch a meat-eating cluster of bonobos where the females are distributing food amongst themselves, you will see the males on the outside looking in in frustration. Believe me, no chimpanzee male would put up with that. No chimpanzee male would allow that to persist. Why share meat? Why is it that unusually <clears throat> the great apes, and particularly the genus Pan, distribute meat? Well, there are a lot of hypotheses out there. A lot of ideas have been put forward, and these have found their way, in some cases, into the paleoanthropological record in terms of the human evolutionary story. But most of them are untested. So some of the hypotheses are distribution by intimidation. You take what you can get. Harassment. You pester someone until they finally just give up and say, OK, have some meat. Reciprocity, I give meat to you today, you give meat to me tomorrow. Alliances, I give you meat today, so tomorrow you'll stand by me when we fight. Courtship, I give you meat, you give me sex. Micronutrients, trace elements or, or things like vitamin B12, which are available in the animal matter, but not in plant matter. The one where the most recent uh, results have come out just in the last 12 months is the meat for sex hypothesis, that is the trading between males and females of meat for sex. And it turns out, it, if you look in the short term, you won't see the pattern. But if you look in the long term, over a year or two, you will see the pattern. And what happens is, I as a male share meat with you repeatedly during a year, two, three, while you're no longer, well, while you're not cycling, but when you come back into estrus, that raises the probability that you will mate with me as a generous male, as opposed to a male who has not been generous. Another hypothesis which is not looking so good is the meat scrap, because all the micronutrients that you would obtain from scraps of meat you can find by eating social insects, which you can do every day without a problem. I mentioned scavenging here just because in many hu human evolutionary scenarios, scavenging is given an important place. Well, I can say that, that the apes are not going to help model that because it just doesn't happen enough in great apes to be of any use. We now know from a systematic study done at Ngogo by David Watts, 10,000 hours of observation, the number of cases of scavenging you could count on the fingers of one hand. It's just too rare to be of any interest. So if we're going to use scavenging to build models of human evolution, we'll have to turn to other sources for information. Now, something about eating plants. Two types, or plant, two types of plant part, 
which have been underemphasized, but which are now emerging as being more important than we realized were underground storage organs, which is just the collective term for that part of a plant which is below the ground and which stores nutrients to some extent. So these would be bulbs, as in onions, uh, roots, tubers, as in sweet potatoes, corms, rhizomes, etc. And we now know that the chimpanzees of Ugala, one of these open country populations, uses sticks and bark to dig up underground storage organs. This is the work of Adriana Hernandez, uh, one of the members of our group. We now know that one population of chimpanzees digs up by hand tubers which are used not for eating but for drinking. There are months of the year in the dry season when there is no surface water for these chimpanzees. And chimpanzees, like humans, want to drink daily. We should be drinking daily. But they can, they can chew the fibers of these tubers, suck out the water, spit out the fiber, and obtain enough moisture to get them through the dry season. And we know that in some cases, chimpanzees have been tempted by the underground storage organs of domesticated plants. So when they discover cassava, then farmers who grow cassava have to begin to worry. Chimpanzees also eat monocotyledonous plants, which is often not given much credit. That is, grasses, sedges, and palms, when these are available. But they don't eat the seeds of grass, and they don't eat the corms of grass, like baboons do. They concentrate on the proteinaceous pith, the inner parts of the stems and the stalks. The pith isn't swallowed, but it's spat out as wadges after the nutrients have been sucked out of that fibrous material. So on, on, the, on the left here, you see some, some lengths of fiber from the phoenix palm that have been chewed, extract the, the nutrients extracted, and then these folded forms are then spat out, left on the ground essentially as, as organic artifacts. On the right, you see a chimpanzee uh, engaging in herbivory, but in this case, the fruit is a papaya, and he's gone to the local garden. And in this case, happily, there are plenty of papayas for everyone, so these human beings can sit and watch him go by. If he were trying to steal pineapples from a farmer who was raising pineapples as a cash crop, uh, then the chimpanzee would have to be a lot more careful and might end up in tears. Shelter. Shelter is something we take totally for granted as a human universal. Here I use it in the broadest sense. I define the term in the sense of any object or structure that buffers the effects of the elements, whether that's temperature, humidity, rainfall, etc. I've already referred to sleeping platforms, and we know that great apes build these platforms daily. They're usually arboreal, that is, they're usually built in the trees and they're usually built for overnight rest, but they can be built on the ground and they can be built for naps during the day. Why build nests on the ground when it's safer and more comfortable in the trees? One hypothesis currently being tested is that we tend to find males building ground nests at the base of trees when females are building nests in that tree and when that female is sexually receptive. So it looks like the male using a sequestering strategy to prevent access to a female by other males who might try to sneak up in the night uh, for a, a quiet mating in the dark. But what we can say about these structures is that they are highly clumped on the landscape. They are not randomly distributed. There are certain sites that are reused repeatedly, year after year after year, and other sites that are never used, and we can look at the variables that are involved. And sometimes this seasonal reuse, this, this reuse is seasonal, usually on a wet versus dry season basis. And at some point, depending on how we define a home base, these reused, these regularly reused sites may approximate the beginnings of home bases. 
But why make a bed in the first place? Well, thermal regulation is one of the hypotheses, that when you lie in a, in a, in a bed of vegetation, it performs an insulative function. If the, if the overnight low temperatures drop to below comfort levels, then an insulated shelter makes life easier. But there are also other hypotheses. Anti-predation, you may be safer sleeping in a nest. Anti-vector has to do with, um, you may have some relief from uh, blood-sucking insects that might spread disease. Um, Anti-parasite refers to um, parasitic infection, which can be related to coming and going from sleeping sites. Brain restoration, uh, it turns out that chimpanzees need REM sleep just like humans do. And in REM sleep, our motoric relaxation is such that if we were trying to sleep in a tree and went into REM sleep, we would then fall out of the tree. So having a nest into which we can completely relax as opposed to sitting on a branch um, may be a very simple but important function that allows neural processes overnight uh, to restore brain function. So you see on the right, sorry, on the left, a day nest. It's not a very nice one because day nests are only used for an hour or two for a nap, so they don't have to hold the chimpanzee for 12 hours. But on the right, you see a nice example of an overnight nest. Uh, and one of my students actually is sleeping in chimpanzee nests and testing some of these hypotheses on herself uh, as a way to be more direct in data collection. Thermoregulation. Um, it turns out that chimpanzees living in some of these open country sites, particularly the ones in West Africa, are having to cope with considerable heat during the hottest time of the day. And in some months of the year, this is extraordinary. So you see across the bottom the months of the year, and you see along the horizontal axis air temperature, and then you see three habitat types, open grassland, mixture of open and closed woodland, and closed forest. So it's not surprising that the grassland is hotter than the closed forest, but you can see that even in the forest, there are months where the average daily high is up above 35. And going out into the woodland means dealing with average temperatures of up to 40. These are averages. This means that actually the temperature range is much greater. So in, in those kinds of ambient environments, um, any kind of thermoregulatory behavior that helps to, to expedite heat loss um, can be useful. And it turns out that some of these open country chimps do things uh, which we didn't realize they do. One is that they make use of caves. So they go into caves during the hot part of the day, not overnight, and they go for, for a siesta, they go for a picnic, uh, they go to take it easy. Also, chimpanzees immerse themselves in rainwater pools. And you might say, well, what's, what's so unusual about get, getting into the water? Normally, chimpanzees avoid water. They're, they're hydrophobic because they drown very easily. Chimpanzees sink like stones. They cannot swim. But in, in Fongoli, um, they, they make use of these pools in the hottest month of the year. So on the top is Sokoto Cave, which is one of the caves that the chimpanzees use in Senegal. On the bottom is a chimpanzee lowering himself into a pool. And those pools are not just used individually, but they're used socially. So we have a pool party, if you will, of chimpanzees. Ranging. Home range size in chimpanzees varies by an order of magnitude as a function of vegetation types. So you could have a range of three kilometers squared, of 30 kilometers squared, and maybe of 300, although that remains to be uh, established. And bigger ranges are positively correlated with the openness of the vegetation. So in this slide, which is looking from an Ugala hilltop, the only evergreen part of this environment are these thin ribbons of forest along watercourses, and all the parts in between are deciduous. 
Those leaves will be shed, well, they're mostly shed by now. Um, and so when chimpanzees move from one river system or one watercourse system to the next, then they are crossing uh, greater distances than chimpanzees who live in equatorial rainforests are doing. In terms of the absolute factor, the, the, uh, the absolute limiting factors on where chimpanzees are found in Africa, all of them have to have some of this closed forest, even if it's as, as little as this. It can be as little as 3%. In some cases, if surface water is not available, they have to dig wells. So water is, drinking water is available only if they go to a dry riverbed and dig down to the water table. Other factors are relatively limiting in terms of chimpanzee home ranges. Resources are ephemeral. They vary in space and time, especially fruits. Knowing when fruits are coming into ripeness, catching them at peak ripeness before they become overripe and rotting is an important thing. It's a, it's a time-space problem. To do so, we now know from recent work that chimpanzees have Euclidean geometric me mental maps, uh, which is basically how they navigate from one grove or one tree that's bearing ripe fruit to another, as opposed to a more simple form of orientation by landmarks. We also know that they have extraordinary memory capacity Literally, thousands of individual trees are remembered by an individual chimpanzee. And these allow for rule-based foraging that we can infer from their activities and, and using GPS to follow them on their daily activity ranging. So something like this rainforest, which to us looks like an impossible problem in terms of remembering what is where and when to be there, they have sorted out. That's remarkable for a creature with no cognition. So what assertions am I going to make to you? I'm, I've now presented the evidence. I'm now going to make some assertions to you about the last common ancestor based on what we primatologists have found in the last five years. I'm going to assert, first of all, that the last common ancestor was probably not a chimpanzee like chimpanzees today, probably not a bonobo, probably not a gorilla, and it probably wasn't some kind of cherry-picked combination of all of the, of the above. However tempting it might be to take some parts of a bonobo and some parts of a chimpanzee and some parts of a gorilla and put it together. But until we find the fossils, that's an open question. Living apes and living humans, just like extinct apes and, human, and humans along the evolutionary trajectory, were all derived relative to the LCA. So, of course, living chimpanzees are highly derived, evolutionarily speaking. But that's not something to, to be worried about. The main point to be made is that inferences about function, about performance, about ultimately behavior, which are based on structure, that is, trying to reconstruct the behavior of an organism based on the, the skeletal material that it leaves behind, or based on the inferred behavior, um, uh, based on, uh, on the, the neural system which is gone, but which leaves behind a cranial capacity. These have repeatedly been shown to underestimate what apes actually do spontaneously in nature. That is, if we had only ape skeletons and no ape behavior, and we tried to infer the behavior of those creatures from the skeletons alone, we would underestimate so many things that we now know from the behavioral studies. Bipedality, which is used selectively but importantly. Thumb forefinger opposition, which if you look at a chimpanzee hand with its short thumb and long finger, you think they couldn't do it, but they do. Long distance travel, aimed throwing, male patrolling. This is a social activity, but I'm, I'm mentioning it because no one imagined it until we saw it. Hunting itself object transport, that is moving objects around the landscape, cooperation, spatial navigation, all of these things are things we know because the behavior of apes revealed it to us. So it seems to me that hypothetically at least, crediting the last common ancestor with the abilities of the chimpanzee 
is a reasonable thing to do, a reasonable starting point for testing. So what about some hypotheses? And this is what I will finish with, two screens of hypotheses. It seems likely that the LCA had a toolkit, had tool sets, had tool composites, and compound tools for a variety of activities, subsistence, shelter, self-maintenance, and sociosexual activities. They all start with S, the five S's. Uh, that organic technology was highly probable, but archaeologically invisible. Right? All those things made out of wood or leaves or skin, they will be lost in the archaeological record. But uh, even lithic technology from the past at the time of the LCA, I think is probably going to be underestimated because it doesn't fit with what occurs from the older one onwards. It's a good hypothesis, I think, based on living apes, that behavior and artifacts varied both within populations, that is, across communities within a breeding deem, and also across populations in different regions or areas. And that this variation goes beyond just simple environmental constraints, that it has a cultural component to it as well. Subsistence technology in the LCA probably involved the transport and reuse of artifacts, which are recycled or retouched. Percussive lithic technology, starting with hammers and anvils, probably important and should leave diagnostic traces on the stones. Compound tools and tool composites, I hypothesize, would be less important at the LCA unless they have the container, which apes lack. So carrying things around, particularly multiple items, I think would have been much easier with containers than without. The other thing is that uh, apes lack meta-tools. We have no records of apes using tools to make tools. Omnivory, which is both opportunistic and tool-assisted, was probably used by the LCA both to acquire food and to process food. Again, probably minimal harvesting of seeds in USOs, again because of the lack of the container. I say lack of the container in the sense that we haven't seen it in any wild ape populations. If the LCA had it, the challenge would be how to, how to detect it. The LCA probably ranged widely, uh, seasonally, knowledgeably, and intelligently in terms of, of, in, uh, of optimal foraging principles. Climatically, we have reason to believe that the LCA was respected more by hydrology, that is, the movement of water once it's in the earth or on the earth, than by crude figures like rainfall. We have reason to believe the LCA hunted and gathered, but did not scavenge for variety of animal prey. And we have reason to believe on the basis of those beds, those sleeping platforms, that they slept socially at bivouac points and seasonal home bases. So in closing, I return to Darwin and a quote from Thomas Henry Huxley's, Huxley's obituary uh, for Darwin published in Nature. Um, he found a great truth, trodden underfoot, reviled by bigots, ridiculed by all the world. He lived long enough to see it, chiefly by his own efforts, irrefragably established in science. And if that statement is true, and Huxley was a great supporter, not an unbiased observer, if that statement is true, then that might explain why we're here today and why we're honoring Darwin in this year. So I just want to thank my colleagues uh, at, the, at LCHES and particularly my fellow chimp chasers. We have a group of eight of us, nine of us now with Linda here. Um, ironically, a lot of my work was supported through the National Science Foundation by Tim Hoyton <laughs> and, uh, and the late Clark Howell. And a lot of people have given me photographs. I just finished with the last image. Uh, that's a chimpanzee in, uh, at Fongoli in Senegal looking through a fence at a field, which used to be a forest, 
and now it's been converted by humans into um, maize production. And that reminds me to say to you what, what, what always needs to be said. We are lucky still to have apes with us. They are losing, however, every year ground, and they will probably all become extinct in the wild in this century, unless or until we make more efforts uh, to save them. And every one of us who studies chimpanzees in nature is in some way or another trying to be involved in conservation, and I urge you to join with us in trying to keep these creatures alive. And with that, I think I'll let it go and say thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Bill, y a Linda, también, que es coautora de esta magnífica presentación, por ser tan claros y, bueno, por supuesto, por devolvernos otra vez a, a ponernos encima de la mesa otra vez nuestro pasado como primate, que es eh, bastante importante en estos tiempos tan poco humanos que, que corren. Y, bueno, si os parece, hemos estructurado un poco el, el debate a posteriori, Vamos a hacer ahora una, una pausa para un café y todas las preguntas, comentarios, reflexiones, sugerencias que queráis hacer las vamos a pasar a la, a la mesa redonda del final de la mañana, porque después justo de la pausa café, que irá de, de, de 11 a 11 y media, eh, tendremos la comunicación, la charla de Alberto Gómez y si os parece el, el, el debate se iniciará después de la segunda charla. Así que tenemos media hora para, para un café y... Volvemos. Gracias.